Okay, this mini lecture pulls together a few different outcomes. Um, we'll look at magnitude of scale. Um, and what's really important is just that you start to get a feel for relative sizes. You don't have to memorize the size of anything, but I want you to know what's larger, what's smaller um, relative to one another. We'll talk about what is a cell and the cell theory, and we'll talk about basically why cells are so small. So what is a cell? A cell is smallest unit of life. A cell is membrane bound It contains DNA, genetic material, contains ribosomes for protein synthesis, and it has cytoplasm, which is the fluid inside. So all cells, whether they're prokaryotic or eukaryotic, have these characteristics. Cells do metabolism, they can reproduce, they use energy. So that's why we call it the smallest unit of life. And this is one of the reasons that I say viruses are not alive. Viruses are not cells. They don't carry these specific characteristics. Now, other people argue that viruses are alive because some of the things they can do. This is just my stance on that topic. And it also relates to cell theory. Those cell theory, cell theory has three components. The first component is that all living things are composed of cells. Okay, and again, since viruses are not cells, I say they can't be living. Cells are the basic unit of life. Okay. And finally, all cells come from other cells by way of cell division. So all cells come from other cells through cell division. Okay. Now, you might say, well, duh, this doesn't seem um, like big news. Why is she having us learn this? And I want you to remember that not so long ago, back in the 50s, we didn't even know the structure of DNA. And if you go back in time, um, 150, 200 years ago, we didn't know what cells were. So it's important that the cell theory was derived and evidence accumulated to support this theory that all cells come from other cells. Cells are the basic unit of life and all cells are composed, I mean all, all cells, all living things are composed of cells. And cells are small. Cells are small because you have to be able to get nutrients from say the outside of the cell to the inside, and you have to be able to get 
waste products from the inside to the outside. And you can see here that if you have a large volume versus a small volume, if you have a large volume, it's going to take a long time for these molecules to be able to move around in a cell. Molecules move by something called diffusion. So if you take a glass of water and drop food coloring in there, you will see very highly concentrated food coloring and then eventually it disperses, it diffuses from the high concentration to the low concentration and you're left with a very light color throughout your water. That's how molecules are moving. They're just bouncing around, moving, moving, moving. And so if you have a very large volume, it's going to take a long time for these molecules to move around to get into or out of the cell. So what a cell wants actually is it wants a large surface area, so that's the outside, right, the plasma membrane, to small volume all the stuff inside so that molecules can move around. So we want a large surface area to volume ratio. Right. The greater the surface area, the more membrane that things can come in and leave through. And the smaller volume, the smaller distance for the molecules to move around in the cytosol. And I for me, this is hard to visualize, but if we look at this chart, I think it nicely explains it. So here we have this little um, one millimeter by one millimeter by one millimeter cell. And so its total surface area is six millimeters squared, and its volume is one millimeter cubed. Say we wanted to make a larger cell. So we increased this size by five, which increased the surface area by 25. So 150 divided by six is 25. So we increased the surface area 25 times. But what happened to the volume is it increased 125 fold. That's huge. Right? So when you just slightly increase the surface area, you really increase the volume. And the surface area to volume ratio goes way down when you have this large volume. Okay. This is not good. We'll put aside. Oh, that's not going to work. Okay. So you want to keep a large surface area to volume ratio. So how do, does a multicellular organism do that? It makes lots of small cells. So an elephant doesn't have larger cells than you. It just has more cells because cells have a size limit where they can work efficiently. Okay. So you want to have a large surface to volume ratio for a healthy cell. And to take up more space, you make more cells, not bigger cells. Remember that prokaryotic cells are really small compared to eukaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells on average are 1 to 10 micrometers, micrometers. Eukaryotic cells are generally, and there's always exceptions, 10 to 100 micrometers. So it can be much larger oops, than a prokaryotic cell. So how does that work? Eukaryotic cells are so much larger, they have so much more volume 
than this little prokaryote, how can eukaryotes survive? Well, eukaryotes do something called compartmentalization. And this is really organelles. So an organelle means mini organ. And you know an organ like your liver has a specific and different function than the organ um, called your heart, right? So they each have specific functions. Same with the organelles. So the mitochondria has a different function in the cell than the Golgi or the lysosome. By making these compartments, you're actually increasing the surface area because remember, all of these organelles are bound by membranes. So you're keeping the volume inside still low. Organelles also have functions where they can concentrate molecules that they need. So eukaryotic cells can be so much bigger than prokaryotic cells because we have compartmentalization, because we have organelles. And if you look at magnitude of scale, you will see, and hopefully you also remember from the endosymbiosis, that organelles and most bacteria are very similar in size. And then of course they didn't draw this to scale, but then the um, animal and plant cells are going to be bigger so that this organelle fits in. You have a lecture on microscopy that's showing you what you can see with a light microscope, what you can see with an electron microscope. And it's not until you get into really big eggs or multicellular organisms that you can see with the human eye without the use of a microscope. And this, I think, is kind of a cool um, illustration of size and scale. Again, you're not going to be asked to know specific sizes, but I want you to understand kind of the relative size because I can't show you things um, with a microscope. We have to kind of imagine. So if you can imagine the size of a coffee bean or a grain of rice, as you start to zoom in, you can even see a grain of salt with your eye or, or a, a grain of sugar. And now we get to single-celled organisms like amoebas, paramecians. A lot of those are bigger than your normal cells. We have a human egg and a human sperm. So even within our cells, they are quite different in size. We've got little red blood cells. Yeast are eukaryotic cells. These are what makes your bread rise. They're small. You've got chromosomes. So where's your, your DNA is organized. And then you've got bacteria and organelles. And remember mitochondria, we think used to be free living bacteria and they're very similar size. And then as you get even smaller, you get into the viruses. So measles, HIV, influenza, bacteriophage. And now you're getting into organelles. Rhinovirus is a really little one. That's what causes your common cold. Molecules such as hemoglobin, tRNA antibodies, or phospholipids, sugar, um, ATP, and down to a molecule. So what you might see on an exam is a list of items and you have to put them in the right order of size. So just take a look at this when you get a chance. Okay, and that's what I have for you for um, why cells are so small.